show from this is this blue line here from 80, 90, 2000, and 2010, and then project it out. At the same time that our country is becoming more ethnically, racially diverse, it is also, interestingly enough, getting older. And the reason this becomes significant is because there's a way of understanding the aging population and the increased diversity in the distribution of our population as suggesting we're getting segments of our citizenry and segments of our voters who have undergone what one author refers to as distinct political baptisms. That is, the most significant political event defining their reality shifts from generation to generation. For some, it might have been World War II. For others, it may have been the Civil Rights Movement. For others, it was the development of videos on MTV, or perhaps Facebook. Or perhaps, by, by political baptism, I mean an event with significant social consequences. Now, this is the last demographic chart. Let's see if I'm lying to you. Nope, that's right, which is this one. This is a chart that indicates the racial composition of each generation projected out to 2060 again, but we already see the uh, distributions here. The greatest generation is which generation? World War II, those ones like my parents, like our parents. Um, in, in World War II, um, th those individuals are predominantly, even as they age, predominantly white. Similarly for the silent generation and the baby boomer generation, but as we get to Generation X, and certainly as we get to millennials, we begin to see that there is this matching of greater diversity as we look to younger generations in our population. Now the reason that becomes significant, and the reason I took all this time with you to talk about this, is because there is a relationship between this demographic change and electoral politics. But I want to suggest to you that it's not a simple one. It's not just one where we say, oh, because the population is shifting, our electorate is shifting, and because our electorate is shifting, we have to think more in more inclusive terms, perhaps, than we've thought before. It would be nice if it were that simple, but that's not what good, hard thinking as citizens tells us. What it tells us is that these changing demographics and their intersection, and one might even say clash with generational shifts, suggest to us that in our politics, we of the, gosh, I can't believe I'm saying this, we, me, of the older generations, right? We of the older generations are in positions to influence what the future politics and likely policy will be in our country that will have lasting effects for the next generation that may be living a demographic reality very different than our own. So how do these demographic changes affect our electoral politics? Well, just a couple of points. This is a graphic that indicates the differences in the voter registration rates among different racial ethnic segments of the population. And these registration rates are noted from 2000 to 2014. These are figures put together by a very good group called the California um, Civic, um, Civic Engagement Project. And what these data show is that as our country has become more diverse, we have a very interesting participation gap that seems actually to be growing as our country becomes more diverse. If you consider the blue line, the dark blue line, the line for white non-Latinos, right, as a percent of, this is just for citizens, eligible citizens. This is not including those people who are not citizens, not including those who are under, eight, uh, under the age of 18. If you look at the percentage of registrants in the United States, it's right now, in at, at least in 2014, was in the neighborhood of about 68% of whites who are eligible to, re to register are actually registered. The number for African Americans is at about 64% or so. Notice how different the numbers are for Latinos and Asians. Almost a 20-point gap. Well, we're a different sort of country, 
we have an opt-in system for voter registration rather than an opt-out system. Most democratic countries actually have the government responsible for registering us to vote. You know why they do that? Because they're democratic countries. <laughs> because they think it's important for government to give its citizens every possible opportunity to vote. Because it's the citizen voice, driven by understandings of popular sovereignty, that are in fact supposed to drive the policy decisions that are made. Well, we're different. We've got a different history. We've got a different culture here as a nation. That different history and culture has consequences as our country becomes more diverse. And in fact, this registration gap here, this registration gap is one, it's hard to see on this chart, it's a gap that is growing more significant for Asians and for Latinos, less so for African Americans and whites, growing for Asians and Latinos as our country becomes more Asian and Latino. Very interesting. Now, how does this relate to who actually votes in general elections? Well, these are some very interesting data. These are data that show that when you look at who actual voters are, so not just registration, but who actual voters are, this is consistent with distributions of the population, when you look at the distribution of voters, most of our electorate is still overwhelmingly white, despite the growing ethnic racial diversity that exists. The gap is not 20 points, as in registration, as a percent, the gap when you look at actual voters is overwhelming. And it is another sign of potential, I'm not suggesting potential problem, potential inconsistency with the way in which our country is moving demographically. Now, this share of the vote is demonstrated again, using Latinos as one example, since we're here for Hispanic Heritage Month, this is the estimated percent of citizens over the age of 18. This is the percent of those who are registered. This is percent of those, excuse me, the numbers for those who, uh, who participate. Notice that as this community grows in eligibility, the gap with registration and with participation becomes even bigger. Interestingly, only 58.7% of eligible Latinos are registered to vote. There are 12.2 million eligible who are not registered, yet of those who are registered, 81.7% of Latinos actually vote. So registration still seems to be a major problem. Now, one more graphic. Truth in advertising. You'll notice that the author of this graphic is someone with a relationship <laughs> to me, who actually will give a talk, I believe, here at Rice in January, I think it is. Uh, my son Bernard, who's also a political, older son Bernard, who's also a political scientist. This is a graphic that he put together to try to show four major racial ethnic segments of the He's a political scientist at Indiana University and doing very well. And uh, <laughs> as far as I know, is currently not looking for a job um, at, at uh, any uh, private prestigious university in the state of Texas. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, he actually may be, I, I don't know. Um, this is a graphic that allows us to understand and see even more clearly the extent to which the share of the population is consistent with share of voters. If it's equal, it's here at this line. Notice the lack of equality for African Americans and the way over time it has shifted to be very close to equality. Notice the over-participation, if you will, of whites, and notice the growing disparity in eligibility and percent of those who actually vote for Asians and for Latinos, and especially for Latinos. Now, with the next graphic, what I want to show you is that everything that I said doesn't matter. <laughs> I want to show you through this graphic that there's a way that even though our changing demographics are real but are not reflected in our voter participation rates, those changing demographics by race and ethnicity can still matter very significantly in determining who the President of the United States is.
This is a graph that I love, mainly because I put it together. This is the graph that I love of the state distribution of votes as best one can put it together. And these are not precise numbers because we're, we're a bit funky as a country in terms of how carefully we track voting. And so we, we do the best we can with polling data, with exit poll data, estimates of voter registration. We have now better voting databases, such as with Catalyst, to try to give us some idea. These are estimates of the racial ethnic distribution of the vote. And I thought I'd pick this particular election for no special reason other than we're in the state of Texas, and the last president from the state of Texas was um, George, w., um, George W. Bush. His, his library isn't here, right? No, it's, it's not. It's, it's in, okay, I won't bring that up. All right, okay. Um, this is the distribution of votes by state for these two candidates where you separate out the estimated Latino, African American, Asian, and white contribution to their margin of victory. Make sense? Whites are white, right? Latinos are this kind of or orange. This is another lighter shade of orange. African Americans are this, are this darker shade here. This is the distribution of votes for the nation as a whole. George Bush won, but he can make a claim to having won a majority of the, the popular vote, although not necessarily reflected in the Electoral College. In this case, it was. In 2000, a little less clearly the case, but that's another issue that we can discuss at a later point in time, which was the most important vote that allowed George W. Bush to be president in the 2000 election. This was the hanging chads issue. Which was the most important vote? I'm saying this because your president is a lawyer, the vote of Sandra Day O'Connor um, on the Supreme Court in the case that went before the Supreme Court. This is, you can make an argument that the reason George Bush won a majority of the popular vote and could claim being the recipient of support from a majority of voters in the United States was because of the support he received from Hispanic, African American, and Asian voters. Not a majority, but enough to be important at the margins. This is the state of California. California is now one of the most, oops, wrong one. California is now one of the most blue states if I can get back to California here in just a minute. There we go. One of the most blue states in the country. And notice that the growth in the Latino population in the state, California by 2030, may be not a majority minority state, but a majority Latino state, first one in the country. That the growth in the Latino population and in the Latino electorate, even though it isn't similar to the participation rates of whites and African Americans is still significant enough to make it, in combination with African American voters, Asian voters, and white voters, a solidly, solidly democratic state. This is a sign of the impact of changing demographics. In the state of New Jersey, notice that the state of New Jersey went for Kerry in large part because of the Latino support he received, the African American support he received, the Asian support he received in combination with a white vote. Notice the support in Florida for President Bush. The Latino vote gave it to him there. So these participation rates, my point here is a simple one. Elections are about numbers and margins. And even when you're not participating at high rates, the margins that you have could determine the outcome of the election these are the data for New Mexico. These are the data for Nevada. Notice that Latino voters in Nevada were critical contributors to the coalition that allowed George Bush to win that particular state. Notice how different the state of Texas is. So what these data allow us to understand is that the influence of the changing demographics, the color, if you will, the influence of the changing demographics is fundamentally dependent upon the distribution of white votes. And should white voters choose to vote together as a block for one candidate or the other, it can entirely overcome the support that may be received by a candidate even at substantial margins. Notice how well George Bush did. Did George Bush need any Latino votes to win the state of Texas? according to that graph. Now, notice the way in which it can help e candidates from each party, even at the margins, but it's all dependent on what the distribution of white votes is. One can make a claim that Latinos, 
have swung states in 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2012 for the Democrats and at times, at least in George W. Bush's elections of 2000 and 2004, for the Republicans as well. Influence of the changing demographics. Notice the difference in 2008 and 2012 when Latino voters overwhelmingly supported President Obama in his, uh, Senator Obama, then President Obama, and then President Obama in his reelection, and the candidates McCain and Romney were not able to build upon the success that George W. Bush had. These are estimates for 2016. Finally, getting to 2016. We'll have a little more to say about 2016 here in just a minute. And we're doing well in terms of time. This is an estimate of which states in 2016 might be significantly affected by the distribution of, if you will, ethnic racial minority voters. Notice that four states, Colorado, Florida, New Mexico, and Nevada, may be highly influenced, we saw that in the previous slide, by Latino voters. African American voters may be critical to a Democrat victory in Ohio and Virginia. And if you combine those two populations, states like Michigan and P Pennsylvania and Wisconsin become significant, and maybe even North Carolina and Arizona. So what's the significance of the nature of our current election and its politics, and the changing demographics of the country, and the way our campaigns have proceeded? and which segments of our population and our electorate may support one candidate or another, we begin to see what the patterns might be based upon our recent past. Now, one might think that I've just made an argument that the changing demographics actually can impact the outcome of our election in significant ways. But I want to suggest to you now playing the role of citizen political scientist, I want to suggest to you that everything that I just told you has to be qualified to a very significant degree. You could make the argument that Latinos and Asians and African Americans are increasingly going to influence the outcome of elections, even at their low participation rates, and that their greater inclusion as a result their greater inclusion as a result would mean that our country, still struggling, but still our country is moving towards more democratic responsiveness, small d, not capital D, more democratic responsiveness to the distribution of preferences within the population. But inclusion has sometimes some very interesting paradoxes, especially when we think of our changing demographics and changing race and ethnicity. There are strategic challenges to leaders of our ethnic racial communities and to all of us that are presented by what I call the paradox of inclusion. One possibility of a group of voters consistently supporting one party over another is that they become subject, as one author put it, to electoral capture. That is, the political party says, we know you'll vote for us, you have no other choice. This other candidate is so bad, I'm not thinking of anyone in particular, this candidate is so bad, we know you'll vote for us. You have no other choice. Some argue, this clearly has characterized the nature of African Americans and their consistent support and high level support for Democratic um, candidates in presidential elections and many other elections, but because we know you have no other option, we don't necessarily have to provide you any policy gains either so that we can, if you will, take your vote for granted. Some argue that Latinos, for example, should vote more consistently as a bloc to the extent that they do. They run the risk of being subject to electoral capture. Another paradox of inclusion is what I call, and I published in an article in the Du Bois Review, symbolic mainstreaming. George W. Bush was the first major presidential candidate who identified his relationship with Hispanics not just as a relationship that he wanted to use to be able to get Hispanic votes, but as a relationship that was extremely important to how he wanted the entire country 
to understand who he was. If you, if you want to see magnificent political commercials targeted at demonstrating respect, honor, and engagement of Latino communities, you have to see George W. Bush's 2000 and 2004 campaign commercials. Symbolic mainstreaming is when one candidate says, we respect your commitment to hard work, sacrifice, family, country, and community. He was fond of saying that Latinos, for example, send many of their sons and daughters to military service at rates higher than many other segments of our population. And so the community, because of its presence and growth, is mainstreamed in the minds of the country. And it's used to cater to those votes. But in fact, once policy gains are expected, they're not produced. So it leads to a similar result as electoral capture, but it's a result driven by greater acknowledgment and inclusion, another paradox of inclusion. And yet a third option is possible. And that is what I call policy targeting. Policy targeting is when that demographic shift that we talk about and the electoral impact that may be apparent is identified as a clear threat to the country, to our national culture, to our language, to our identity, to drains on our social services, to the rule of law. There are too many of you here who are illegal aliens. There's a way in which even having the growth and in influence that I identified can then lead to a reaction that further marginalizes these segments of our population, despite the fact that they are growing in terms of their percent of our population. So what do we conclude from this consideration? And what can we say about the nature of our changing America? Well, certainly we can say that non-white influence in national and state electoral politics will only increase as their percent of the population grows, especially as driven by younger Americans. We can say that these voters can be determinative in affecting the outcomes of elections for both political parties, but that depends on the vote distribution of other segments of our population and the ways in which candidates and parties pursue their strategic outreach. But the paradox of, conclusion, of inclusion suggests that counterintuitively, greater political incorporation could lead to greater policy marginalization through capture, symbolic mainstreaming, and policy targeting. So how do we as voters exercise our responsibilities of leadership in this election? What vision do we have of our nation's future? And what kind of a legacy do we choose to leave our children and our grandchildren? There is a quote from Roberto Mangabeira Unger, a well-known legal political theorist at Harvard and Cornell West, um, professor of religious studies and African-American studies, uh, now at Princeton, used to be at Harvard, in a book they published in 1988 that I think begins to give us a way of understanding what those responsibilities are. They say, to understand your country, you must love it. To love it, you must, in a sense, accept it. To accept it as it is, however, is to betray it. To accept your country without betraying it, you must love it for that in it which shows what it might become. The point I'm trying to make here is that this election and the choices we are able to make may say more definitively than anything else we might decide what our expectations are of our country and what our expectations are of ourselves. These are data on, from, taken from 2013 on the percentages of our children who live in poverty subdivided by race and ethnicity. Notice the intersection with the demographics that I was referring to earlier. We know what the consequences are for sizable segments of the next generation if we pursue politics as usual, whatever our partisan affiliation. 
We know. And we know who pays the price. Now, we all 